join me in prayer, please. Our Father, we come this morning for one purpose. And Lord, it doesn't matter what the weather or where we come together. We come together because we are your body. We are your church. So Father, even on this rainy morning, we come and we invite you to be a part of our worship time. Father, we ask that you will gather with us here as a group, but Father, that you will be in each of our hearts. Father, may our minds be in tune with yours right now. Father, so that we have the pleasure of receiving a word from you today. But Father, also so that we can show you our gratitude and our love. Father, you have promised that where we gather you there will be also. And because of that, we are grateful. I want to thank you for the blessings of this morning already that you've bestowed upon us. Father, you've seen our needs. You've heard them expressed within our own minds and within our own hearts. You've seen our hands that were raised. And Father, you've heard that we have voiced the concern and the love for Brother Charles and for Miss Carolyn and their families. Father, we know that you work for the good to bring praise and honor and glory to your name through each life circumstance that we experience. And Father, even in those difficult times, we know that you are there and that your hands hold us and that your arms surround us. Father, help us to feel that peace and that comfort. Father, we ask for healing. Father, we ask that you heal our loneliness. Father, those evil thoughts that separate us from you. Father, in our greatest times of need, we turn to you. And we're thankful that you are already there working in those situations. Father, we also come this morning and we recognize that we have sinned. Father, probably already in some form or fashion, even in the few hours that we've been awake. Father, we ask that you would wash us once again clean. Forgive us where we failed you. And Father, help us to be the people that you want us to be. May we be your hands and feet. Father, as we pray for one another, may we not only use words to pray for each other, but Father, may we use actions. So give us the strength and the willingness and the courage to do all of these things in your name so that you may receive the glory and honor that you so richly deserve. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Remembering God's blessings in the past brings us great joy. And with joyful hearts, we'll sing together, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Would you stand as we worship?
this morning. So uh, we're going to go right into a medley of praise starting with my tribute. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. To God be the glory.
praise the Lord, the sunlight of heaven isn't determined by the clouds outside today. <laughs> I'm reading from, oh, please stand for the reading of God's word. It's been a while since I've done this. And I'm reading from the book of Mark, chapter 7. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left her daughter, and she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon was gone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite our deacons to come forward now to receive this morning's offering. And uh, Brother Jim Hunter will be coming to lead us in prayer this morning. Pray with me. Our Father, we cannot outgive you. We cannot match the priceless gift of your redeeming grace. Help us all remember that our appropriate response is to go forth and live and love boldly. In this moment, help us to give boldly as well. Because we love your son and we thank you for the gift of his grace and his love and his life. We pray in his name. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Nancy. And I've loved the music this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, did you notice on the, on that first hymn, uh, da, 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 what is that one? Joyful, joyful. Did you notice the organ was just soaring above? I just love that. I just think that's exactly what that organ is supposed to do is to soar. So just stand on those pedals, Linda, every, every week. It's just been a beautiful day. Even though we're not in the park, it's a beautiful day. Let me talk to you about next weekend. It's a big weekend. Uh, festival, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've heard about that. On Saturday evening at 6 p.m., we will have a special citywide commemoration of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And our choir and the Methodist Church Choir have gone together and are doing a commemoration event right out here under the tent. Um, you can bring a lawn chair, but there'll be chairs there too. It's going to be about a 45-minute service, about a 15-minute break, and then the Wolf Brothers. So you can just boogie off your blues after, after the commemoration event. It's going to be really, really nice, and I, I hardly want to encourage you to come. See me this week on Wednesday or Thursday if you feel like you need a way to get up to park closer. I don't want parking to stop you from coming. It's going to be a really nice event. It's a one-time only thing. You have to be there to see it, and uh, I've seen the whole script. I've seen everything put together, and it's just going to be really nice. Hope you'll be there. Next Sunday, the Lord and Dennis Boyd willing, this will be our last Sunday in the sanctuary next week. Dennis, are we still on target for that? So the renovation, we, uh, we hand the keys over on Monday, the 13th, to the contractor. So next Sunday will be the last day it looks like this in worship. Be here. And we're going to do some special things to commemorate that experience. I'm going to miss this brown spot <laughs> the most. Because I often think every time we get the carpet cleaner out and clean it, I think of Lady Macbeth. I'll clean it up a little bit for those of you who aren't used to Elizabethan English out darned spot. <laughs> so the only way to get rid of this spot is to cut it out and throw it away. So that's all going to happen. So next Sunday, be here for that special uh, event, our last day, and hopefully we'll be back in by Easter in the spring. So it's exciting time, isn't it? These are, these are great days. So next weekend is a big, important weekend. Uh, I kind of miss having a dog around the house. We had a dog, and Buddy was extremely convenient because after dinner, you didn't have to clean the floor. <laughs> uh, Buddy just did it all. Now, Buddy's hair, I'm still finding years after he's been gone. You know, we still find remnants of Buddy. I don't miss that part. And uh, Buddy had a particular smell. I don't miss that part. But he was a good old boy. Uh, our grand dog has found a place right under our granddaughter's chair at the dinner table. And you know why, because half of what was on her plate goes on the floor, and Tucker the dog gets a feast. from it. Dogs are handy to have around, and here they show up in this strange text today. It's one of the oddest texts in the New Testament, and I want us to unpack it because I think there's a message here for us to hear. Now, if you drop your sandwich, it's a race to beat the dog to the sandwich, right? And now Mark gives us a Markin sandwich. Didn't you like that transition? I thought that I worked on that one. Um, Mark gives us one of his famous Markin sandwiches. He bookends a conversation on uncleanness. Remember, if you were unclean, you were excluded from society, you were excluded from worship, uh, people shunned you 
if you were an unclean person, and lots of things could make you unclean. A disability, a physical disability could make you unclean. Your actions could make you unclean. Your birth could make you unclean. And so the bread of this Mark and Sandwich is Jesus having conversations about uncleanness. And the meat in the middle is three, is three stories. The first one we'll talk about. Jesus meets this woman from Syria-Phoenicia. The second one is Jesus heals a man who was deaf and mute. And the third one is Jesus feeds the 4,000. Not the 5,000 Jews, Jesus feeds 4,000 Gentiles. The sandwich. So anytime you've got a sandwich, the topic is what's on the outside, the bread, uncleanness, but the meat is what's in the middle. Mark has put these three stories together between these two pieces of bread for a reason. And it's our job this morning to figure out what that reason is. Jesus goes on vacation to a foreign country. He went over to the Mediterranean coast. And I need one of you, someone who's a better Bible scholar than I am, to, to tell me, but I think this is the only record of Jesus appearing on the Mediterranean coast. He was more of a lake guy than an ocean guy. You know, maybe he didn't like salt water so much. But here Jesus leaves Palestine, Israel, and goes to a foreign country to a town called Tyre. It was a natural port, and because it was a natural port, with a natural breakwater around it, it was a very attractive port. And the city of Tyre and its companion city, Zidon, became very wealthy places. These were Gentile places. These, they called themselves Greeks. Now, this is 300 years after Alexander the Great conquered the world, but they still thought themselves as Greeks. Wealthy, sophisticated. Why did Jesus go there? Did he know someone in Tyre? Was he invited? We have no idea. The text is completely silent. But Jesus goes to this foreign country, and there he is in this house, apparently on vacation. He's taken a break from the healing business and the people business. He's worn out. But he cannot keep his reputation hidden, and a woman comes to see him, a desperate woman. Her daughter has a demon. I don't know how we would diagnose her in our day and time, except to say her little girl is dreadfully ill, and she needs help. And so the woman comes into the house where Jesus is staying. And I want you to get this, the social dynamic here. Here is a woman who is of the ruling class, probably wealthy, who kneels at the feet of a Palestinian homeless man. Do you see that? There is humility in this woman. Is she a believer? We don't know. Is she desperate? We know that. And she comes and she begs Jesus to cast this demon out of her daughter. So how will Jesus respond? Well, he's on vacation. And so he could say, Tuesday. I'm taking appointments for Tuesday. Instead, he says one of the weirdest things Jesus ever says in the Gospels. He turns her down by saying the children should be fed first. Odd. This is not 
uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world we, that we sing, this value that we hear that Jesus came for the whole world. He says, you don't give the children's food to the dogs. What a strange thing for Jesus to say. Is he calling this woman and her girl, her little daughter, dogs? Now, Jesus is, is telling us that his message was first for Israel. He came for the lost sheep of Israel. But Jesus is following that Old Testament pattern given to Abraham Israel then to be a blessing to the nations. That was the plan. And Jesus is saying to this woman, I'm following the plan. I feed the children of Israel first, and I don't give their food to dogs. Is Jesus really calling this woman and her daughter dogs? So all week I've been reading commentaries on this, and I've got to tell you, they're all over the place. Uh, there is no consensus that this is the meaning of this story. Uh, some say, well, what, what Jesus is really doing, the term he uses is a diminutive term, little dogs. He's calling this woman and her daughter puppies. Well, we like puppies. Do you want to be called a puppy? That doesn't feel right. Uh, some have said Jesus was being playful. He was doing this with a smile and with compassion. Does that sound like compassion to you? If, someone, if you go to someone's house and ask them for a drink of water and they say, I don't give my water to the dogs. Ha, ha, ha. That doesn't feel very funny. Oh, Jesus, another idea is that Jesus is testing her. He's just pretending to put her off to see if she will come back with faith. i got to tell you, there is not a word about faith or belief in this story. This is unlike any other stories in the Gospels. Nobody here is believing or expressing faith. Maybe Jesus is quoting a common proverb. Oh, you don't give the children's food to the dog. That doesn't feel any better. It still sounds like he's calling her a dog. So if Jesus said that to you, what would you do? Would you slip away and hide your feelings? Embarrassed? Oh, sorry, I even asked. I know it was wrong to ask. Maybe you'd be mad. How dare him? But this woman comes back to Jesus. And there's almost a sense when you read the text that Jesus is speechless. She says to him, Lord. And, and it's interesting that that's in the text because it's the only time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is called Lord. Get it. This rich Syrophoenician Greek woman is the one who says Jesus is Lord. But she says even the dogs under the table get to eat the same crumbs as the children at the table. Get this. This is the point. And, and I'm grateful to Pastor Ryan Algram of the Lutheran Church in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, his commentary I found to be the most helpful. This woman is making the case for the dogs. Now, you need to know some things to understand this text. The Palestinians, the peasants, the, the, those that Jesus uh, was raised with and was around uh, had no tables. They did not eat at tables. They ate, they, at, at dinner time, they would roll a mat out on the floor and everyone would eat on the floor. There were no crumbs on the floor. 
And um, they had no dogs. The, the Palestinian Jews saw the dogs as unclean because they, eat, they ate dead stuff. Dogs were scavengers who ate Roman roadkill. So dogs were unclean to Jews. They did not have dogs. There were roaming dogs outside, but they were not a part of their community. Rich Syrophoenicians ate at tables. Crumbs fell off of tables, and they kept dogs as pets. You know, if you're a, uh, if you're a pet owner, you're more like this Syrophoenician woman. You keep a dog in the house who helps you. There's company for you. And so this woman, this Syrophoenician woman, is making the case that even the dogs need food. What she's saying to Jesus is this. My daughter and I may be dogs. In fact, I didn't say this. The Jews call, would often call Gentiles dogs as a term of derision. It was an ugly thing. Even Gentiles eat the food of the children. Jesus' response is odd. When I read this story, I just I almost hear a pause in Jesus. He's never lost an argument, but now he's lost it to this Gentile woman. Because he sees in her what he has been preaching. Humility. Persistence. God's love without borders. And he sees in this Syrophoenician woman everything he has been telling the Jews to be. And without leaving the house he's staying in, Jesus casts the demon out of the little girl and when she gets home, when the woman gets home, her little girl as well. Now, Jesus' ministry is still going to be to the lost sheep of Israel. But now we know that Jesus does not turn his back on any person in God's creation. Pastor Algram says that this story is an indication of Jesus changing his mind. What I want to say is that this story calls us to change our minds. The food served on the Lord's table is meant for those who sit at the table. And it's meant for those who are under the table. And it's meant for those who are still away from the table. The food of heaven is for you, even if you're a little dog, under the table. The three stories I mention in Mark's sandwich. Jesus healing the little girl in Tyre. Jesus healing a man excluded from Israel for his disability. Jesus feeding 4,000 Gentiles with bread and fish. All have a common theme. The big tent of the gospel is far bigger than any one of us realize. Let them who hear, who has ears, may hear. Amen. Let's stand for our singing. loves us all. We stand amazed in his presence. We'll sing, Oh, how he loves you and me, followed by, I stand amazed in the presence.
here and hope you have a great week, great Labor Day. And Miss Linda's going to hobble over here and <laughs> say our benediction, and we'll follow that by um, singing our choral benediction together. <laughs>